Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Glauber, and I'm a senior research fellow at IFRI and acting secretary for AMOS, uh, the Agricultural Market Information System. I'd like to welcome you to today's jointly sponsored AMOS IFPRI webinar. Um, today, we're going to be looking at the global rice market. I think uh, throughout the first half of 2022, when wheat, maize, and soybean prices were nearing record highs um, following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the rice market remained, by contrast, relatively calm. Um, Major rice producing areas were far away from the Black Sea, and, uh, and global rice stocks were at the highest levels that we've seen in, in about 20 years. Uh, this began to change um, in the second half of 2022. Just as wheat and maize prices were falling, rice prices began to rise uh, following the floods in Pakistan that cut production in stocks. And as we've seen this year with, with news of a strengthening El Nino, with threatened rice yields in, in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, and then uh, thirdly, uh, export restrictions, um, uh, which have been in, re imposed recently by India. Uh, India is a major rice exporter uh, that accounts for some 40% of exports. Rice prices have been up almost 40% from year ago levels. Um, and put in this context, uh, uh, still well below the level seen in 2007-8 when rice export restrictions affected almost 80% of the global rice trade. I think we have a great panel to address these issues. Uh, we're going to start with Shirley Mustafa, who's an economist with uh, the Markets and Trade Division of the of FAO. Uh, Shirley's been the uh, chief rice analyst for Amos and is recognized as one of the leading rice analysts in the world. Shirley will be giving us an overview of the global mar rice market. Shirley's going to be followed by Christina Justice, who's a senior faculty specialist at the University of Maryland. Christina is the primary coordinator, author, and developer of the monthly GeoGlam crop monitor for early warning. GeoGlam, uh, as many of you know, is a key member of the Amos Secretariat, providing crop monitoring information using Earth observation data. The uh, crop monitor for early warning effort focuses on regions with high food security risks. And we're just very happy to have her. She'll be talking about El Nino and the potential impacts on global markets. Christina will be followed by uh, a colleague of mine here at IFRI, uh, Abdullah Mamoun, who's a senior research assistant where his recent work includes repurposing agricultural support, uh, forecasting export restrictions and trade effects. Abdullah is a key architect, uh, along with uh, our former colleague, David Laborde, in the development of IFPRI's Export Restriction Tracker, a widely cited tool that tracks restrictions by country and commodity. He's going to focus on export restrictions impacting uh, the, the rice market. And then lastly, but not least, uh, is another IFPRI colleague of mine, Fusani Traore, who's uh, a senior research fellow um, located in Dakar, Senegal. Uh, Fusani has conducted research on agriculture agricultural trade has done a lot of work on global cotton subsidies and and access to energy in rural areas in Africa. Husseini is going to talk about the importance of rice in Senegal. And as we've been doing uh, uh, after the presentations, uh, we'll be joined by Seth Meyer, who's uh, USDA's chief economist and the current chair of Amos. And he and I are going to uh, moderate the discussion that follows. And with that, I'm going to turn right to Shirley and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thanks so much. Hello, good day, everyone. Sorry, I had a bit of a mishap with the microphone there. Um, and thank you, Joe. I'm very happy to walk you through our global rice market and situation and outlook here today. And uh, I have just a few slides here to help me do so. So thank you very much for putting them on on, on the screen. Um, uh, like I said, a few slides, but it doesn't mean I, I, I necessarily mean I have little to say, actually quite the contrary. So in the interest of time, allow me to, to get uh, to it straight away. If we could please turn to the first slide. 
Right. Um, well, to set the stage, uh, so to say, it may be helpful here to begin this roundup uh, with production and by recalling some salient features of the past rice season, that is the 2022-2023 season, which faced, as some of you may be aware, some key constraints uh, on the production side in the form, of course, of surges in input costs uh, that rendered rice cultivation unprofitable in some areas, and in particular on the weather front. And uh, Joe also mentioned some of these this major events that happened last year, of course, including uh, the destructive floods in Pakistan. Now, this translated into a global rice production decline, uh, not a very pronounced one as we still saw an above average harvest last season, but importantly, a production decline that affected various important rice exporters as well as China. Now, the outlook for the 2023-24 season, so the ongoing season, is somewhat different here, even though uh, this season, of course, has not been without its setbacks either. And this is especially from the weather front. In fact, in places that began the season uh, first, so those located along and south of the Kuwaita, we saw production disrupted by weather adversities linked to the protracted La Nina event, which uh, prevailed through March 2023 and negatively affected output in, in, in various South American producers, but also in Eastern Africa, and it also broad excess rains in, in Australia, which is Oceania's largest rice producer. In other places, the, the weather adversities have instead been associated with the prevailing El Nino event. Now, I realize GeoGlam colleagues, like Joe mentioned, will provide you with a more detailed account of El Nino, of the El Nino event and its impacts on production. Uh, for the sake of conciseness here, I will limit myself um, to stating that its effects during the ongoing 23-24 season have been especially felt in parts of South and Southeast Asia, so including Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Nepal, in the form of later below normal rains, and arguably also in India, where despite uh, an overall normal cumulative uh, level of monsoon rains this season, uh, rains were not evenly distributed in time and space. Now, in these areas, this has in turn affected development of main crops, which are now at the harvest stage. But if its effects, or rather the effects of the El Nino event, are also likely to extend into off-season or secondary crops to be planted towards the end of the year in parts of Northern Hemisphere Asia, and to 24, 25 crops planted along and south of the equator around this time as well. Now, I say this in part because, as you may know, these crops are predominantly irrigated, and given the rainfall patterns that we've seen in recent months and expectations for the next few months, they could face a tighter overall water availability situation for irrigation. So to date, the key constraint in, on the production side has been doubtlessly weather. But I should clarify that adversities have not been generalized. In fact, in some places such as Pakistan, which again uh, last year was, was uh, so production considerably reduced because of the devastating floods, the season has actually progressed rather favorably, uh, despite, of course, some lingering input constraints um, being experienced. More generally, too, we've seen this season characterized by market improvements in the profitability of rice cultivation due to, of course, declines in prices of basic inputs, in particular fertilizers, that have occurred since last year, but also due to increases or concurrent increases in local rice prices registered across many rice producing areas. Now, keep in mind that, of course, government policies are also highly influential on all aspects of the rice sector. And, and on the production side, of course, a support from governments has remained overall steadfast. Now, this improved profitability setting has in turn elicited planting recoveries, if not expansions, particularly for the main crops that, as I mentioned, are now entering or are uh, in the process of being harvested. Now, this generally positive unfolding of the season, in particular in places such as Cambodia, Myanmar, the United States, and various uh, West African countries, including Cote d'Ivoire and Senegal, uh, that you will hear from a little bit more later in, in this discussion, is really what underpins our expectations of production really uh, uh, increasing in, this, in Africa this season, but also recovering in Asia and Northern America, and to some extent also in Europe. So put together, this could translate into an overall global harvest of around 523 million tons on a milled rice basis. Now, if this level is eventually confirmed, it would be an overall positive result because it would represent a 1.1% recovery from last season's outcome. At the same time, it would not be a record harvest. It would fall short of the 2021-22 result. And this is, again, namely because of the weather constraints being faced this season. Now, if we could please turn to the next slide. 
Now, let me quickly turn to international trade and prices here. And, and again, here it may be useful to recall the production disruptions faced by various rice exporters last season. Now, these disruptions coupled with very strong import demand, particularly from Asian buyers, drove fairly consistent increases in international rice prices between early 2022 and mid-2023. As Joe mentioned in his earlier intervention, of course, these increases that started in early 2022 it were not particularly pronounced and nowhere near as pronounced announced as, as the increases that were registered for other grains, of course, wheat and, and maize in particular, but they were fairly consistent, right? And, and in fact, if, if, if we look at international rice prices through the FAO benchmark, which is the FAO Rice Price Index, uh, well, international prices rose by an average of about 1.4% each month between early 22 and mid-2023. But since then, we've seen a further acceleration in international rice prices. And this has been largely prompted by two factors. Uh, the first being concerns over the impact of the El Nino phenomenon on rice production. And the second one being, of course, as, as, as you also already mentioned, rice export restrictions, and in, in particular, a stepping up of rice export restrictions, most notably by India. And uh, now we say stepping up because, as you may recall, already in September last year, India banned uh, exports of fully broken rice, then imposed a 20% export duty on non basmati and non parboiled rice, otherwise called as Indica white rice. Uh, however, since July, we've seen a further intensification with, with Indica white rice now being uh, fully banned, rice exports now being fully banned, a 20% export duty being liable on par parboiled rice. And uh, uh, let's say a basmati exports not being registered and unless they have a value of usd 1200 per ton or more but i realize if the colleagues are going to get into the nuances of these uh, export restrictions a little bit more so, so i'll keep my comments here rather general um but what this implies uh, or what these steps have essentially implied uh is that it, essentially all broad categories of Indian rice exports um, could be potentially impacted by one form or another of export restrictions, be they outright export bans, as is the case for, for broken rice or for Indica white rice, or export taxes or floor prices, right? Now, I say potentially and could rather intentionally here, because many uncertainties really uh, still cloud these export restrictions, and spe especially in terms of their duration, and of course also because the government of India has allowed for some exceptions to the rice export bans on food security grounds and upon requests from governments. In fact, to date, we've seen a host of shipments approved under such a, uh, such exceptions, including for countries uh, such as Gambia, Singapore, ne Nepal, to, to name just a few. Um, now, uh, I have to say also, and again, if my colleagues are going to get into this in a little bit more detail, that, of course, India has not been a, the only country to impose rice export restrictions, um, but uh, the Indian export restrictions have been uh, the most influential of the lot. And this is, of course, given India's prominence in the international market in terms of it being the leading global rice exporter. In fact, the destabilizing effects of the export restrictions were very much Im immediately evident in the market. Market. And, and of course, because they generated a certain uncertainty regarding the, the, the security of supply, and, and this prompted some actors to rush to the market to secure supplies, to withhold supplies from the market, or to renegotiate contracts, uh, of course, on expectations of higher prices, and, and as is natural, I think, to expect in other exporters, the restrictions also fostered expectations of greater sales, right, uh, which in turn also exerted, exerted upward pressure on prices. Now, of course, here it may be useful to highlight highlight that rice is not a uniform commodity. In fact, as you may have noted from the chart to the left, uh, not all prices, uh, not all uh, varietal uh, groups have also seen their prices being uh, particularly bullish. Japonica prices, for instance, have actually eased in recent months. But I hear what is uh, here, I think what is critical to note is in particular that uh, the classes that India uh, has applied the most stringent export restrictions, in particular the, the Indica rices, essentially account the vast majority for the vast majority of international trade, right? And hence their movements have tended to overshadow developments in other rice markets. Now I will very quickly go through our trade uh, use and stock expectations here, but I read because I realize I may be overdoing my welcome. As you may have seen from the previous uh, slide, we do expect international trade to remain subdued 
between 23 and 24, and this is in part associated uh, with, uh, of course, the imposition of the export restrictions, even though strong demand from Asian buyers in particular could keep overall trade volumes uh, at uh, comparatively abundant levels. Now, if we very quickly turn to my last slide, please. Now, in terms of utilization, the current context of high domestic uh, rice prices and high international rice prices doesn't necessarily uh, bode uh, particularly well for rice utilization. In fact, we see global uses stagnating at around 520 million tons, which would essentially represent a second successive season of little to negative use growth. And to some extent, this is very much influenced by our expectations regarding animal feed uses. Um, but uh, in terms of messaging, uh, this, this current setup, so a setup of uh, a production recovery, even if only partial in stagnating utilization, it would essentially imply that we could be headed towards a rebound in rice carryovers, which could in fact uh, reach an all-time high of around 190, 99 million tons. And while this would traditionally or under normal circumstances bode well uh, in terms of, of signaling an overall abundant supply situation, I think it's worthwhile to highlight uh, that in this particular case, uh, the, these figures need to be seen uh, in a particular lens. And this is namely because uh, we see a lot of the stock accumulations taking place in just a few countries. So from the export side, the United States, and of course, in particular, India. Um, and on the importing side, uh, China and Indonesia. But outside of these four countries, we are actually seeing, our forecasts are actually pointing to a second successive season of the drawdowns. So uh, beneath an overall, what would seem an overall abundant uh, outlook, we do see some, some, some signs of concerns. So I will, I will stop my intervention there. So, so back to you, Joe. Thanks so much, Shirley. That was excellent. Ex perfect, exactly what I was looking for. So let's, uh, Christina, we're gonna turn to you. Great. Thanks, Shirley. Thanks, Joe. Good day, everybody. Um, great to be here today. So today I'll be presenting on the current INSO and IOD conditions, uh, uh, the forecast and the potential climate and yield impacts. Um, with that, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, so first to give an overview of where we stand and some key points of this presentation. So INSO has been an El Nino phase since the end of May. Uh, this is now rated as a strong event that's forecast to last through March to May, 2024. In addition, uh, the Indian Ocean Dipole is currently in a positive phase that's forecast to peak around November and last through January. And a positive IOD can actually enhance the drying and wetting impacts of El Nino, and I'll speak to that later on. So these events will likely induce precipitation patterns across the world, and in some areas, uh, these impacts have already materialized, as we heard from both Joe and, and Shirley regarding the impacts to rice in South and Southeast Asia, particularly in Indonesia, Thailand, and Nepal. Um, so crop yields are likely to be impacted in several regions, which we'll also go into more detail on later on in this presentation using some historical analysis on this. Uh, next slide, please. So strong El Nino conditions uh, are now present and, and are forecast to reach peak intensity during November to January. There's a three in 10 chance of a historically strong event uh, that could even rival the 2015-16 and then the 1997-98 uh, El Ninos, both events that led to severe regional yield implications and also food insecurity in, in different regions. So the stronger the El Nino, the more likely temperatures, precipitation, and other patterns will reflect the expected El Nino impacts. So the current El Nino conditions are likely to persist through March to May 2024, after which neutral ENSO conditions have an elevated probability and El Nino a decreased probability of occurrence, which you can see on the graphic on the right, uh, showing the ENSO forecast probabilities issued in October with the El Nino forecast probability in red, La Nina in blue, and neutral ENSO conditions in gray. Next slide, please. So El Nino conditions tend to increase the likelihood of above and below average precipitation across many parts of the globe. Uh, and this graphic depicts these modes, showing the location and the timing of likely above and below average precipitation related to El Nino events. Um, so this graphic is based on observed pre pre precipitation from 22 El Nino events since 1950. Typically, El Nino events tend to enhance rainfall relative to the average in Central Asia, Southern North America, Southeastern South America, Southern Europe, Eastern and Southern East Africa, and Southern and Eastern China. And then drier than average conditions, which you see in the brown areas, um, 
tend to occur in Central America and the Caribbean, which we're already seeing, Northern uh, South America, parts of Northern East Africa, Southern Africa, India, Northern China, and the Maritime Continent, as well as Australia. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to the current El Nino, the Indian Ocean Dipolar IOD is currently positive, which started in August and is continuing to strengthen. So the IOD index right now is at plus 1.85 Celsius for the week uh, ending on October 8th. This is the sixth highest weekly IOD index value since records from the Australian Bureau of Metrology Sea Surface Temperature data set began in 2001, with all higher index values observed during the positive IOD of uh, 2019. So a positive IOD can really exacerbate the drying and wetting impacts of El Nino. And the graph shown here are from the Australian Bureau of Metrology from their October 12th update. So on the left hand side, we see the forecasted monthly sea surface temperature anomalies for the IOD region. Um, so the, it's those areas bordering the Indian Ocean. Uh, and we can see the positive ID, IOD conditions appear from August as temperature increases above 0.4 into the red zone and are forecast to last through January 2024. On the right hand side, the graphics show the average forecast value of the IOD index for each international model surveyed for the selected calendar month, so November, December, and January. As you can see by January, those forecasted numbers are starting to go down and, go down and even cross below the positive IOD index. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, the positive IOD can enhance the wetting and drying effects of El Nino, and this graphic shows the location timing of these likely above and below average precipitation related to positive IOD events, and this is based on IOD events since 1960. So of note, we can see these enhanced drying effects in Australia, southern Southeast Asia, uh, southern, East, uh, southern uh, Africa, and enhanced wet effects across East Africa, as well as parts of China. Um, so next slide, please. So taking a look at the long range precipitation uh, forecast, we can see that these El Nino precipitation anomalies um, are forecast to materialize. And in some cases, we've already seen them start to materialize. So here are the current November to April sixth month precipitation forecast from WMO. So you can see that the forecast is already being influenced by the El Nino and positive IOD conditions. So in the areas circled in red, there are high probabilities of having those below average precipitation outcomes, including Australia, South America, Southern Southeast Asia and Southern Africa, and the areas circled in blue showing those areas with a high probability of having above average rainfall, including parts of East Africa, as well as Central Asia. Next slide, please. Um, so turning to temperature, here's the current November to April six months temperature forecast from WMO. And over the next six months, we are expecting to have generally above normal temperatures across the globe. Um, and this could exacerbate areas where dry conditions are likely. Next slide, please. So moving now to crop yields and what these events might mean. Um, so while crop yield impacts really can vary from one El Nino to another, and there's a lot of uncertainty around that, uh, from a recent historical analysis of crop yields during El Nino events for the four main prim um, primary commodity crops, um, so wheat, maize, soybean, and rice. Um, this research was undertaken by NOAA, NASA, USAID, and UCSB Climate Hazard Center. So we can look at what El Nino might mean for both global and regional crop yields. Um, so what has been found is that at the global scale, El Nino teleconnections do typically offset one another for maize and sorghum. Um, so those areas that are having above average um, production are offset uh, by those areas having below average production, and there's no discernible, um, um, discernible impact on global yield. So this is at the global scale. For wheat, the average impact of El Nino is slightly negative. However, 40% of El Ninos do not result in below expected wheat yields. Um, however, for rice, during El Ninos, global rice yields do tend to be between 0 to 2% below uh, expected, and then global soybean yields tend to range from uh, uh, negative 0.5, so slightly below average, to 2.5 uh, positively, so above. So on the right side, you can see the graphical representation, uh, representation of this historical yield um, outcomes and conditions during El Nino events. So you can see some of those trends appear that we talked about in the precipitation really start to appear in the crop yield. So we're seeing, you know, impacts to uh, potential wheat in, in Australia. We're seeing rice impacts in, in South and Southeast Asia, and we're seeing uh, impacts to in, um, main season maize, so maize production in, in parts of Southern Africa, um, and then slightly above average production in, in parts of the US for, for several crops there. Next slide. Um, so, at, so that was at the global 
uh, level. When we go down to the regional level, however, there's a kind of very different story of crop yield impacts and, and they tend to be more significant. So for maize and sorghum, on average, from this historical analysis, we found that El Nino's really tend to lead to above average yields uh, in the US and in Southeast South America, uh, but below average yields in India, China, and Southeast Africa. Um, for wheat, above average yields are more likely in the US and in Central Asia, but below average in Australia, Southeast South America, India, China, Europe, and North Africa. And then for rice, uh, yields tend to be slightly above average in the US during El Nino years, while slightly below average below average throughout South and Southeast Asia, um, as we've already seen starting to materialize. And then particularly we're finding these impacts to be robust in India and Thailand, and then uh, also slightly below average rice yields in Brazil. Next slide. Uh, so in summary, strong El Nino conditions are now present and, and forecast to really reach their peak um, from November to January and then persist through May of 2024. Um, a positive IOD event is currently present and could exacerbate the effects of the ongoing already strong El Nino in countries surrounding the Indian Ocean. So um, kind of heightened uh, alerts in, in those areas. And then long range forecast for the WMO showing for the next six months does show a likelihood of reduced rainfall over those over several key producing regions um, and, and showing kind of those similar El Nino impacts. And then above average global temperatures uh, are expected. Um, and then crop yields are likely to be impacted both negatively and positively, depending on the crop and the region. So an overall heightened monitoring is really necessary uh, to monitor the impacts of these crops uh, yield outcomes as they develop. And, and next slide. That's it from me. Thanks, Joe. Back over to you. Yeah, no, thanks, Christina. That's that's great. And um, we'll uh, turn to um, Abdullah Mamoun uh, to talk about export restrictions. Thanks, Joe. Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk about export control measures and the scope of these measures, and the likely impact of this export control uh, in rice market, and the market reaction. Next slide, please. So let's go straight to the export control measures that were taken by India. So last year in uh, September, India put two types of export control measures, the one on ban on broken rice, and then they also put export levy of 20% on unmilled and milled rice. So India being the largest exporter in the world, so this put a, uh, the worm to the global market. So, and in July, of this year, India put another round of ban on non basmati white rice that exclude the parboiled rice. So this ban effectively put a jolt in the market. So as we will see in the in the price effect, in August of this year, India put another sets of restriction, uh, twenty percent tax on parboiled rice, and they imposed the minimum export price on basmati rice. So these types of export control measures are to discourage exports of rice further. Next slide, please. Now let's look at the table here. So this will give you the idea that how these the export control measures are affecting the volume of rice. So if we take the 2022 export level, we see that the uh, the, the the export ban on broken rice, uh, India exported uh, in 2022, 22 million tons of rice in that year. So out of this 22 million tons, 6 million tons are uh, the, the non-Bashmoti white rice that exclude the parboiled rice, and three million, 4 million tons of broken rice are exported in that year. So we can see that uh, the the likely impact of uh, this ban or the quantitative restriction is uh, around 10 million tons that can be blocked by India. But let's not forget about the export taxes that they put on uh, different grades of rice. Uh, this can hinder or the flow flow of trade to the global market. 
So, uh, the, so this is the uh, this is the case that we see. Let's uh, next slide, please. So now let's look at these uh, two types of rice. I'll uh, highlight a non basmati white rice and also the the broken rice. So, the global map shows that the India exported a lot to the the sub, some some of the sub-Saharan African countries, but they also exported uh, to to the the Asian countries, including China, Sri Lanka, Nepal, uh, Vietnam, and uh, Malaysia. But in sub-Saharan Africa, Madagascar, Kenya, uh, Angola, and Mozambique, these are the countries uh, who, who highly imported uh, the, the non-Bashmati white rice from India. So you can clearly see that the, how these countries can be impacted if the if the uh, the ban on non bashmati white rice is is put on very effectively by india so the on the right hand side panel if you as you see that madagascar as the top importer of non bashmati white rice from india they are still able to uh, import uh, from india but the overall the the from uh, from march april onwards to july we see in in this year we see that the madagascar is importing less and less of non from non much much rice it could have been see ideal to see that what is the impact from after july when the india announced the ban on non much rice but we don't have the figure right now at the moment but uh, as you see the uh, the india being the top uh, uh, exporter to madagascar of this non bashmati white rice but Madagascar is, impo is importing less compared to 2021 and 22 level of ex uh, import uh, of, of this kind of uh, rice. Next slide, please. On the broken rice in the world map, it is clear that the China is the biggest importer of uh, broken rice from uh, India. Uh, they imported a lot, uh, more than 2 million tons in 2022. Uh, but, uh, in the in the right hand side, you you see that the the India's the current ban on broken rice is impacting the China is not not importing a lot from uh, uh, from India uh, in this year, especially after March April, the China is uh, not importing any uh, broken rice from India. But on the other side, the 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 sub countries in sub-Saharan Africa they are importing. Uh, they are still allowed. Uh, I think th th it's it looks like that the, the these countries are exempted from uh, the export ban on broken rice. So, but still, uh, if you compare with the 2022 level, uh, that ex the import level on broken rice from from these countries are uh, relatively lower. Next slide, please. So. What are the reactions from other mar rice market uh, we see? Uh, as, if you recall in 2008 food price crisis, uh, there, was a, there were a lot of domino effect uh, when the large exporter put a export control measures, uh, other countries, other large exporters also uh, follow so. But in this time, only we see that Myanmar put initially uh, the export licensing on export uh, the export of rice. Uh, so this, uh, though Myanmar is not a big exporter, but still uh, uh, they put in export, li uh, export licensing or export control measures. But we don't see the other actions from Thailand or Vietnam or Pakistan. Uh, we don't see much of action uh, on, on from those countries. So this is a good news. On uh, Philippines initially put a price cap on retail rice prices, but they lifted it after one month. So that's a, a minor action from uh, in Philippines to con to contain domestic market. Uh, on the good news side is that ASEAN countries in September they committed that they would refrain from using any export restriction. So that means that the uh, the countries in uh, ASEAN ASEAN region like uh, Thailand or Vietnam they would not put any export restriction on rice. So that's a welcome news for uh, for for the global rice market. They also committed that they would release uh, their emergency rice reserve, uh, but we're not sure that how significant that would be to, to calm the market. Next slide, please. 
So as my uh, previous uh, speaker uh, already talked about the, 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 the production outlook and the stocks for 2023 and 24, I'll not go details into the into this, but as you see that uh, the, 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 the projection for 2023 and 24 season is 172 million tons of rice uh, as an ending stock, China being the largest holder of this stock, uh, followed by India and ASEAN countries. But uh, we need to see that whether this stock uh, will be released to the world market. Uh, next slide, please. So the market, previous slide. So the market reaction uh, in terms of prices, uh, we see that we, here I have plotted uh, three different types of rice, uh, three different markets, uh, India, Thailand, and Vietnam. And you clearly see that after the announcement of the export ban in July of this year, the, the rice market is up. Uh, the international price, uh, we see that in Vietnam, uh, from, uh, from the level of uh, $542 a ton, it climbed to $642 in, at the end of September. In Thailand, uh, uh, from $572 a ton, it climbed to uh, $610 in September. Similarly, in uh, uh, in India, the the reaction is a uh, uh, little bit lower, but still the the price is up. So on average, the global rice price at the international level is up by twenty percent. Next slide, please. So what about the retail market? In the retail market, we see that most of the in most of the markets, uh, the price is up. The, notably, the spike is uh, seen in uh, Tanzania, Uzbekistan, uh, uh, Haiti, Mali. But there are also few countries where the price is uh, below from the from the year ago. Next slide, please. So this is uh, I'm bringing a good example where the market still remains uh, the stable. Bangladesh, you know that the the world's largest consumer of rice is. Uh, uh, where the market see that the, the price has even uh, gone down uh, from the from the year ago. So this is a uh, despite that uh, they have a very high food inflation uh, of twelve point five percent. So why how the, the the country has achieved this uh, the relatively stable market? Uh, the there are many factors. Uh, the one is that uh, the, the country has a good harvest of paddy for last couple of seasons, and the government of Bangladesh also could pro provide smooth supply of unit inputs. So that contributed uh, uh, the good harvest of the paddy. Uh, the, the government also implemented a strict uh, law of anti-hoarding so that the market manipulators cannot, uh, cannot make the market unstable. So this is uh, uh, this helps uh, the market to stay below or stay stable in the in the rice market. The government also made a good decision. Uh, they put import decision in advance so that they don't face a shortfall suddenly. So this uh, this helps. And finally, the government also provided uh, rice supply to the 10 million. Uh, low-income households, which are subsidized, so this helps uh, to to make the country uh, to 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 make the rice market uh, relatively stable. Next slide, please. So, in summary, yes, uh, because of these export restriction measures by India and also by Myanmar, we see that uh, the price has gone up by twenty percent. Uh, at the international level, but the retail prices are also gone up. But we need to be watchful uh, what will happen to the weather event, and we need to be watchful to the the, the harvesting that what we get the numbers at, uh, at the end of the year. And we, we need to also see that whether India will extend the current uh, restrictive measures beyond 2023. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Abdullah. Um, uh, so our, our last speaker is Fustani Trare. Um, but before Fus takes the floor, I just want to remind everyone that to participate in the question and answer session, you can submit your questions on ifpre.org or Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag uh, AskIfpre. 
on Twitter or on X, I guess, as it's now known. Uh, so, uh, Fuseni, please. Yes, thank you, Joe. I'm going to give a brief overview of the importance of rice in Senegal, where I'm based. And uh, actually, we can find similar pictures in other West African countries, such as Mali, or Cote d'Ivoire, or, or Nigeria. Next slide, please. I'm going to start with the demand side. And I think the most important thing to, to, to keep in mind is that rice is the most consumed cereal in Senegal. It is actually used in the preparation of the main dish here called Chepjed, and it represents only 4% of total cereal consumption. So one third of total cereal consumption is made of rice. And there is a urban rural gradient. In urban areas, it represents more than 50%, and in rural areas, it represents about a quarter of cereal consumption. And if you look at the consumption per capita, it is between 80 and 90 kilograms per capita per year. And even if you consider the lower bound of 80 kilograms per capita, this is actually twice the average of the ECOWAS region. So it is very high. And here again, we have a rural urban gradient. And the consumption per capita increased by 7% between 2010 and 2019 due to income growth, urbanization, et cetera. And if you look at the share in expenditure, first of all, if you look at the share of food in total expenditure, like in many developing countries, that's not a surprise. The share of food is very high. So almost two thirds of uh, expenditure is made of food. So that's not a surprise. And if you look at the share of rice, it is about 10% in total. And of course, there is a rural urban gradient as well, lower in urban areas, the share in total consumption. And if you look at the share of rice in total food expenditure, it is about 15%. And here again, we have a rural urban gradient. And given these high shares in total consumption, and also the high share of imports in domestic supply, that I will show in a minute, we can see that the country is highly exposed to external shocks. Next slide, please. A few words about supply. So in Senegal, we have basically two production areas. In the northern and eastern part of the country, we have the Senegal River Valley, where we have irrigation. And in the southern part of the country, the production is mainly rain -fed. And this southern part accounts for about two-thirds of total production. Next slide, please. So still on supply, rice represents 40% of total cereal production, so it's very high. And uh, as you can see in the graph, production doubled between 2010 and 2021, but that's not enough. That's why we have still imports that have been stable around 1 million metric tons. So that's a huge amount. Actually, if you look at the import dependency ratio, that is not shown here. Over the observation period, it is always about 50%. So the share of imports in domestic supply is above 50% over the entire period. Next slide, please. Now, where do all these imports come from? Very simple mainly from Asia, and in Asia, mainly from India. Over the entire period of observation, as you can see on average, the share of India is 57%. And the second partner is Thailand with an average share of 15%. So these two countries represent above two thirds of total imports. The other countries outside of Asia are mainly from Latin America, Brazil, and and this is mainly broken rice. That's also something important to keep in mind. When it comes to imports of rice in Senegal, it is made of 98 or 99% of broken rice, actually. Next slide, please. So this is a projection exercise we did a year ago with a colleague of mine to see whether the country could be self-sufficient or not. Because under PRACAS, PRACAS is the 
main agricultural component of uh, the plan for an emerging Senegal. So under that program, the country should have been self-sufficient in 2017. And as you can see, it didn't happen. So this is a, a projection exercise we did to see whether this might be the case. We use econometric models to project demand based on income growth, population growth, et cetera. We did the same thing with projection, production using moving averages, et cetera. And uh, our results show that actually only in 2013, you might see um, the two curves crossing each other. So the country might be self-sufficient maybe in 2030, according to our projections. We can come back to that later on given the assumptions we used. But for sure, under the PRACAS program, the country was not self-sufficient in 2017. Next slide, please. A few words on price transmission. Here I'm showing the domestic price, the national average, and uh, the export price of the two main trading partners of Senegal, India and, and Thailand. And what we can see is that there is a strong correlation, particularly when you look at the period after the introduction of the ban, which is shown here with a vertical line. But the domestic price is much less volatile than world prices. By world price, I mean export prices here. So for instance, the volatility of the domestic price was only 4% compared to 28% for the Indian variety. So the domestic price is much as volatile. This is due to public interventions, such as price savings, for instance. And another important point to, I would like to mention is that there is actually an asymmetric transmission between world export and uh, domestic prices. And this is due to the market structure, actually. The market is an oligopoly. So there is a market power which creates a downward rigidity for, for prices. That's what we found in a study last year we did with another colleague of mine. Actually, the elasticity of transmission is between world and domestic prices is much, much more higher when world prices go up than when they go down. And this is not something new and it is not specific to rice. We find similar results for a lot of products and in a lot of countries so that's also important as you can see if you look at the left hand side of the graph before the vertical line you can even see that the two prices are evolving in opposite directions the domestic price and the two world prices are evolving you know, in opposite directions so there is an asymmetric transmission and again that's not something new that was expected next slide please now, what can be the impact of high prices on, on households? I already showed in my introduction that the share of rice in consumption is high and also that the share of imports is high. So households are highly exposed to external shocks. This is a study done by SOSU and IGE in 2019, where they simulated actually four scenarios. I'm presenting here only two. In the first scenario, that they call short run so they increase they simulate an increase in producer and consumer prices by 15 percent so in the short run we have no response from households or from producers meaning that all the elasticities are set to zero and in the second scenario they allow a response from both producers and households and the methodology is actually based on the net benefit ratio developed by Giton in the late 80s meaning that you consider households both as producers and importers, you compute their net trade position, and then you perform the simulation on that. So what are the, the, the results of these two simulations? You can see the results in terms of impact on poverty. Here it is the incidence of poverty. So the percentage of households with spending below the poverty line, as you can see, it is 4% on average in the short run and 4.26. There is no significant difference between short and long run. And we have a difference between rural and urban areas. The rate in rural areas is much lower. Why? Because we have more net sellers in rural areas compared to, to urban areas. Next slide, please. So I would like to finish with a few words on public policies. 
First, regarding price incentives, actually the nominal rate of production is positive. It is about 14%. This is a figure coming from the last MAPAP report. But more interestingly, if you look at the nominal rate of assistance, it is higher than the NRP. This means that we have more budgetary transfers going to the sector in terms of uh, input or production subsidies or net income support. And uh, regarding tariffs, Senegal is a member of ECOWAS, which is a customs union, and the common external tariff is set to 10%. Some people are pushing for a 35% tariff, but it is still not the case. Uh, other measures have been frequently used since the 2008 crisis, and this involves actually duty tariffs and VAT exemptions, price savings, and consumption subsidies. And to finish, regarding public expenditure, actually the rice sector receives the highest share of agricultural public expenditures, almost two thirds. This is mainly allocated to investment in irrigation and also in input and production subsidies. That's why the NRA is higher than the NRP. But there is a challenge. Uh, the upstream sectors, uh, such as transformation, milling, or storage seem a bit neglected. And that's one of the main results coming from the last MAPAP report. And uh, I would like to thank it by that. Thank you. Over to you, Joe. Thanks so much. That was really excellent. Um, okay, so we're going to turn to the moderated discussion portion of the program um, where we get a, a chance to ask a few questions, and then we're going to go to Q&As. And I think there's a, already some some good Q&As uh, that have come in or good questions that have come in. Uh, I remind everyone to submit your questions um, on whatever platform you're using or use the um uh, uh yeah whatever platform you're using seth why don't you come aboard um and why do, why doesn't everyone else uh go ahead turn on your cameras and um we'll just uh begin the discussion but i'll let you ask the first one Dr. all right Meyer. No, great no uh, and a great set of presentations uh, and I've, I've got questions which you know, when I ask these questions, I might give a name, but if you've got the rest of you, if you've got comments, I'll come come right in. And and I think, uh, Shirley, it was the very comprehensive. You got a lot in there a short amount of time. I know you probably couldn't get to everything. So here's a quick question for you. When I look through your presentation, I, I get a general sense in the global uh, market that why are why are rice prices rising so why have they risen so sharply i think you started to get in there at the end saying hey maybe it's who's holding it maybe it's other restrictions from your own presentation let me give you a chance to expand on that or maybe we can point out some of the other things that other folks have mentioned why are the, why are we where we're at with rice prices when you're talking about carryout stocks coming back to maybe near record level Thanks, Seth. Um, well, yeah, that I could take hours to discuss that question alone, but I, but I realize I need to be more succinct, so I'm going to do my best here. I mean, part of it is a question of timing, right? When we're speaking about carryover stocks, we're speaking about carryover stocks, at least for our forecast, that would eventually, the bulk of which would actually be in October 2024, right? So because we're extremely early, if it's not just starting the 2023 2024 season, and there's a lot of time left, and so and of course a lot of those outcomes hinge on some assumptions that we as analysts take regarding the path of certain variables including policies and whether they're well informed realistic or not uh that's a shame the oh. hello oh we lost ahead, just for Shirley. a minute Shirley. We, we were we were hanging on every word so if it was a strategy <laughs> it was good so why don't you pick it up and keep going okay. Well, I'm happy. Well, well, part of it is also on the import side. I didn't necessarily delve a lot on the import importing trends recently, right? And and I think I, I, here I would like to touch a point also that was covered by by by, by the presentation in IFPRI's uh, by by the IFPRI colleague, in that we've seen demand being very strong, 
essentially since 2020, we've seen record-breaking trade, right? And a lot of it has been very much driven by Asian demand, right? And this Asian demand has, has come in the context of, of course, increases in, in domestic rice prices, as highlighted by, for instance, Bangladesh, but also broader inflationary pressure and depleted government stocks, right? So this year as well, we've seen a lot of, despite prices being steadily increased, and we've seen a lot of still action on the market, and, and most notably from countries such as Indonesia, which of course has, has been very actively buying through the state-owned enterprise bullock. We also have some other factors playing in, of course, we're in countries where perhaps some measures were, were not necessarily taken, or let's say the impact of the, the increases in input costs that were registered last year were not attenuated in one sort of way, be it the government assistance or through, or through other uh, types of schemes. Of course, we're also seeing the effects of that in terms of, of course, the increased production costs being passed down the rest of the supply chain. No? And this translated into, into greater uh, uh, higher international rice prices. I think also we've got some seasonal factors ahead. I mean, I think uh, one of the uh, aspects, rather, we have some seasonal factors at play, uh, especially when it comes to carryovers and the, and the carryover reduction of last season being particularly felt now. So in the end of the, literally in the tail end of last season and, and, and in seeing some suppliers such as Pakistan, of course, count on very availability, very little availability at hand to respond to demand until the new crop actually reaches the market, right? So, so this is also about the timing of, of demand. Uh, so very brief, briefly, I would say that. <laughs> I hope I've covered at some points. Great. Let me let me follow up on something. Um, and 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 I think it, it surely I, again drawing on your excellent presentation. You know, we, we look at things like export restrictions, and um, uh, Abdullah has this great. This has done this great work with the export restriction tracker to sort of talk about what percent of the rice crop is is impacted by these uh, export restrictions. But I think, as you pointed out, export restrictions really vary in terms of intensity and what their ultimate impact would be. And so, for example, the the the, the nice table that uh, Abdullah put together on 2022 rice. And looking at those individual tariff lines, you can see that non-Basmati, non par boiled rice, that plus broken rice, almost 10 million tons. But clearly, we're not seeing a drop of 10 million tons being forecast, right? That that uh, it's it's somewhat less than, or in, in fact, a, a lot less than that. Um, and I think that that, uh, I guess, some of it, uh, the, the questions I would have for you, Shirley, would be one, what are the assumptions made on, say, these restrictions? Do we expect when you're doing your analyses, do you expect those those to remain throughout the year, or is it, you know, what I I know with work at the board uh, at you when I was at USDA, we had conventions that said policies are in place until we hear otherwise. We assume normal weather moving forward. Things like that. That that. Are embedded in these forecasts, and I um, and Abdullah, you may want to talk a little. I mean, you mentioned in your presentation already that even something like the broken rice export ban wasn't nearly as firm as as you might think just by reading in the newspaper. That in fact, a lot of 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 grain con or a lot of broken rice continues to be shipped to sub-Saharan Africa, for example. So, comments from either one of you uh, would be fine. All right, thank th thank you, Joe, and I think you you hit on a on a very critical point, and and in fact, I, one one of the aspects or one of the key messages that I really would have liked to transmit with my presentation really is the level of uncertainty that there is in the market, right? And and that and this is also reflected in in the way we are actually coming up with forecasts, and that they're really tentative. And and yes, there are generally some uh, let's say anchors that we traditionally use to generate the forecasts. So, for instance, as you mentioned, assumptions 
terms of normal weather conditions and the absence of clear cut indications of where weather, uh, the weather might be headed, right? Or no changes in policies. Uh, but in this particular case, particularly in the case of India, uh, things are a little bit more complex because of the room being left uh, by the government of India in terms of uh, approving exceptions on a food security basis, right? And, and this is where perhaps they were, where you might be seeing, and why aren't we saying 10 million tons if these export restrictions could potentially target 10 million tons? Why are we, aren't we forecasting a 10 million ton drop, right? And, and this is partly it, but admittedly, it, we don't have, <laughs> despite our role as forward-looking analysts, we, we don't necessarily have a crystal ball in terms of, of, let's say, having an assurance that our assumptions regarding the level, the pace of exceptions uh, are necessarily correct or not. And this is, in fact, why I think it's very clear, it's it's, neat, it's necessary to make it very clear that a lot of these, uh, let's say, uh, forecasts or our assumptions are very much clouded in uncertainty. Uh, as for the, the broken Inside and I, and I will very just uh, briefly mention this: it, the broken uh, uh, exports and the impact of the broken ban are, to some extent, uh, particularly for markets such as China, are already being uh, seen or witnessed in the market this year, right? Because this is a policy that uh, essentially uh, was put in place already in September last year. And because of these exceptions, again, to, to go and underscore the fact that there are some mitigating factors there at play, take for instance, countries such as Senegal have 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 been ben, uh, have, have been the, the beneficiaries of some of these exceptions on the broken broken ban, and there have been other African countries as well. That, so that has tended to, to, let's say, limit the overall impact. This may not necessarily be the case of China, right, which was very much uh, per, uh, purchasing this brokens to feed go into the feed industry and 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 there are different dynamics there in terms of perhaps what what may be an understanding of what food security needs are and also the effective needs of china to actually uh, rely on broken rice in the context of of course already increases in its own grain availabilities for instance the feed wheat uh, because of its its domestic wheat dynamics so so i would I would mention that host of factors more or less to 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 explain why we're not necessarily seeing a, such a sharp export decline. Yeah, no thanks. Um Abdul, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Uh no, I think uh Charlie explained uh very clearly that uh why th th there is a mismatch on the well, the likely impact versus the drop in uh the in the stock. But uh, uh, I just want to add that uh you are right, Joe, that uh this depends on uh how hard the ban is and as we see in the broken rice cases uh the african countries are still able to uh, import uh, the broken rice from from india despite uh, there is a ban so i'm not sure whether uh, uh, these countries are exempted from this ban but uh, clearly they are able to uh, the import but uh, one the other thing is that i would like to discuss the point it, here that how why China is not is not uh, importing any uh, or there is no import figure uh, on the broken rice uh, from China uh, uh, from India uh, by China. So that's an interesting point. So I was reading uh, an article uh, just yesterday, and I saw that the, the Vietnam uh, is exporting uh, uh, the the some some amount of rice to China, uh, especially the broken rice. So is that uh, uh, they are importing something from uh, Vietnam uh, that we need to look at uh, clearly. And also we need to see after July, like we have uh, August, September and October. So this month, we if we have had the data, we could clearly, we could more specifically say that how the ban would affect uh, uh, the, 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 the rice market uh, in the importing countries. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks. And I think you, you, you're right. The, 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 uh, unfortunately, the trade data always lags a little bit. Uh, some of these countries actually, like China, are, are pretty good in terms of timely, um, uh, timely notifications. Uh, uh, same generally with India, too. Uh, but again, even with that, you're still running a couple months. and We should have Indian numbers soon, I think. Um, OK, Seth, uh, over to you, and then we'll yeah. go to Q&As. All right, I, and I think this is starts out as a Christina question, but maybe turns into a Fosini question on on maybe substitutions and thinking about rice consumption in Senegal and in the region. 
So Christina, and kind of building off what Shirley was talking about at the timing. So Shirley's saying, yeah, you're going to maybe end the marketing season with this rice under more normal weather assumptions. And you and and so and I'm, this question is going to be vague because I don't know. I'm looking to your expertise to tell me more. I, I, I think we're, we're talking about an El Nino that you say might peak out around December. You know, if I was sitting back in September, so maybe only 45 days ago, I could go around the world and I could explain adjustments to crops and I could say, oh, I can see the El Nino contribution to this. Um, and, and right now we're sitting at that time, you know, we're talking about low Thai reservoirs, uh, maybe concerns about the Rabi crop in India. So when you think about, and, and again, this is a vague question, you take it where you want. If we, as we talk about the onset of El Nino, the peak of El Nino, how certain, you know, when are the effects likely to hit? Are we setting ourselves up okay for a growth in this uh, of this rice crop because it's going to hit at a at a time of maybe a smaller impacts? And then how sure are we we going to it's going to go away considering we had a triple a triple dip La Nina? Yeah, no, great question, Seth. I mean, in terms of the timing of this El Nino and the, and the peak of the El Nino in terms of where we are in terms of rice production for Southeast Asia in particular, we're coming into the dry season rice period, right? And so there's a lot of reliance in terms of irrigation. We're coming off of already kind of a dry period, especially for Thailand, um, for their wet season rice um, growing period. And so if we're already coming from a, from a dry period where we started to see the impacts of El Nino in parts of Southeast Asia, not all of it, but particularly in Thailand, we were seeing those dry impacts affecting the wet season rice coming into what we think of as the irrigated rice period for the dry season rice. I think that certainly is a concern. Um, and the same for South for Indonesia, where we're coming into instead of coming into a dry season, we're coming into the wet season rice. So where they're more reliant in terms of um, rain fed production there. And so having decreased rainfall, which is what we're expecting with the El Nino, in addition to the positive IOD really could mean yeah, a, a potential production uh, or yield at, yield reductions, uh, and that's also what we found in some of the historical analysis that that we undertook. And then I, I'm going to ask you a little bit more because I I want to get to to maybe Senegal and East. You know, you you showed you showed a chart which kind of talked about the El Nino effects, kind of in that that band in Africa having a negative effect on other grain productions. Um, so maybe that maybe this is more of a question of is our sub so you're talking about maybe higher rice prices at the same time you're talking about maybe negative domestic production of other crops. How big of a concern is this? How much of a substitution is there between those crops? So maybe that's a both a Christina and a Fossini question um, about hey, are we we've got a compounded effect here. Right, absolutely. I mean, what we were finding is for West Africa, it's a bit more mixed because there's not as strong of, if we think of El Nino, there's not as strong as a connection in terms of precipitation and El Nino outcomes. There are um, in some areas uh, in like the central band, but um, in Senegal, what we were finding from the yield analysis that we did for El Nino is that there was only really impacts on sorghum, not so much on rice. Um, but there are there can be dryness across West Africa during El Ninos, but it's not as strong as some of the signals like we get in Southeast Asia in Southern Africa, where given the strong El Nino that we're but that we were a are already coming into. So it's already been noted as a strong El Nino and, and we're expecting to see that in Southern Africa in, in Southeast Asia and, and, and impact the precipitation. So I might pass it over to to my colleague to talk about the, the Senegal um, situation and, and what might be able to and also the regional impacts in terms of if there are substitutions uh, in terms of regional production there. Yeah. Yes. So do you think there's a, yeah, t tell us about what you think the, the concern might be and the ability for consumers to substitute or not. Yes, yes, thank you. As you mentioned, actually, we didn't see when we look at the forecast, we didn't see a major difference compared to last year, actually. So the forecast projection is between 1.2 and 1.3 million metric tons in terms of paddy rice so in milk equivalent it will be slightly below 1 million metric tons so we are not expecting a huge change in terms of production for rice uh, millet and sorghum are below rice in terms of share in consumption but what is important is that 
all the prices tend to move together. So even if they are not directly impacted, so there are some strategic behaviors in market. So when a particular product price goes up, other prices substitute tend to go up also. So that's something we might be a bit concerned of. Uh, regarding rice trade, actually, if we look at Senegal, Senegal doesn't trade that much with its neighbors. We have some trade flows with Mali and other trade flows with Guinea-Bissau. And uh, in other regions, actually, the main concern may be between Nigeria and Benin. That's why we, where we see the main trade flows taking part, and they are mainly informal because we usually have export bans or high tariffs above the uh, ECOWAS CET in, in, in Nigeria. Yes, but uh, we haven't seen any major issues in terms of forecast. And uh, if this is the case, our prices may go up, but not that much actually. But due to that strategic behavior, they may go up a little bit. Great. Okay, no, thank you, Joe. I'm going to pass it back. Oh, go ahead. No, Shirley, Shirley, please come in. So sorry if I, if I may just weigh oh, no. in very briefly on this. I mean, and I, I generally tend to agree with, with what has been said so far by Christina and by the colleague, I, but I think perhaps it's it's it should be highlighted that it's not easy to generalize conditions vary widely from country to country uh, from season to season uh, from when the, the the nino emerges to when it actually intensifies right in the case of senegal for instance also you may have other factors at play in terms of of course river flows upstream uh, because in, in in like senegal like many countries in in asia also has multi cropping and within one particular crop cycle also has very production systems so, so some parts are definitely much more dependent on rainfall as opposed to other ones being much more dependent on river flows for irrigation right and 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 so it, and this is one of the particular difficulties let's say in 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 encountering a weather anomaly of the sort is that every sort of assessment needs to be done it needs to be extremely context specific and time specific because as, as Christina has also highlighted right the El Nino emerges in one period of the year also coincides with with a with a particular stage of the cropping season in one country that may be different in another country right and this is also and we may have overlapping seasons in some cases which is for rice is particularly the case between the northern hemisphere of season crops and the southern hemisphere main crops of the following season no so we may even there be seeing a different effects because of the stages of of, of the season so i just wanted to to, to add that in particular, uh, just to say that it's very difficult to generalize. So, so not, but not a particularly easy question to approach, admittedly. Yeah, no, thanks. Yes. That, that, that's really great. Let me let me uh, go to some of the questions. Uh, some of these we, we've we've touched on already, but I, I want to get um, there. There's a number of, of questions for you, Abdullah, uh, which uh, um, so be on your toes. I, I one of them is um, uh, so, so there's a couple of questions that I think are quite interesting. One, there's uh, from one coming from, um, uh, I believe, from Nigeria, saying a few African countries restrict milled rice exports and encourage partially milled rice. So, again, these are these are uh, we 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 see these differential restrictions on various processing stages uh, occur. Uh, I, I I probably think of it oftentimes more in terms of things like uh, soybean oil or, you know, relative to soybeans. But but again, some of this um, with, say, flour and wheat or or rice and, and I guess, milled rice and milled rice, um, do you, can you comment on that in terms of the, the data in the export restriction tracker that you're, things, do you see that in, in various countries? And then a second question, a little bit unrelated, but one that I think we we need to often take when we think about export restrictions, we often focus on what the impacts are on the rest of the world. What are the impacts on on domestic producers, which I think are uh, also quite quite important here? If you can address those two, Abdullah. Uh, yeah, uh, I think these are very relevant and quite important questions. So. The thing is that uh, our export restriction tracker is tracking uh, the, the commodity at the 
the HS harmonized system of code, HS4 level, uh, but uh, we are not going into at the HS6 level, uh, which could have been good. But often you, you know that uh, these restriction measures, uh, uh, when the country announced, uh, they put uh, they don't specifically uh, put a particular grade in this case the even though i mean as you see the the restriction that we see the 20 percent tax on uh, some grades of rice and ban on uh, other grades of rice uh, so that uh, sometimes it is very difficult to track it very at a, uh, a very disaggregate level so uh, and also we uh, in this case, rice flour or uh, any derivatives of rice, we, we we are not able to monitor that. So will not be I will not be able to comment on that uh, how the, the the those restrictions uh, will be. But uh, we we still have some uh, detail level on on these restrictions. Uh, so this is the 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 question. Uh, I, I don't know whether I could answer uh, it more more specifically. Uh, what what was the other question? Sorry. Uh, yeah, just what the impact on producers, domestic producers are, and and Fus, you may want to comment on that as well. So the, on the domestic producer side, uh, if it depends on the whether the the producers are net seller or the net buyer. So if they are net seller, and uh, if the the if the if there are export, export restriction on in the exporting countries, definitely they will be impacted uh, negatively because the price domestic price will go down because uh, there are uh, overflow of uh, supply in the in the domestic market so yeah so the domestic producers will be the if they're net seller they'll be impacted but if they're net buyer uh, definitely they'll be uh, they'll be in a position to get the benefit of the lower prices of uh, of the commodities that are currently in place uh, on the uh, for export restriction okay uh, Fus, did you want to comment Yes, uh, and regarding what I mentioned earlier in terms of aggregate figures, I, I agree with what Shirley said, of course, and regarding Senegal, there is a difference between the northern part, which is irrigated, and the southern part, which is mainly rain fed. And this part is, of course, mostly sensitive to, to climate change or to, to the climate in general. Uh, regarding sports restriction in, in the region, and that's a real issue, and uh, ECOWAS is trying to address that. and. Uh, I think Joe, you might have even worked on that a little bit. That's why they put in place a regional reserve for grains. And uh, actually, rice is not the main product cover because it represents less than 10 percent. I think it is only 7 percent to avoid countries putting export restrictions whenever we have prices go up. And uh, what it creates, basically, as Abdullah mentioned, is they try to stabilize domestic prices or to lower them. But what it creates, what we have seen working with seals and other partners in the region, it just creates informal flows, actually. So you, you, you create informal flows and producer will, will not sell in the domestic market and then will sell, they will sell on external markets using informal channels, actually. Um, a couple of other questions have come up uh, on export, on the, the uh, ASEAN statement of, of from back in early September on what a justified restriction on export uh, would be. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, uh, essentially it was a comforting message from them, but it was, it was still vague in the sense of, of uh, it, it seemingly said that there might be a justified restriction on export restrictions. Um, Abdullah, what, what do you make of that? Uh, is, is that a big loophole or, um, I mean, we saw, certainly saw in the past um those countries impose some of those ASEAN countries those big rice producing or in rice exporting countries like Thailand and Vietnam in fact put on export bans um so over to you yeah I think uh still if, if you see the announcement they made in September right so we are now in October and we don't see any uh restrictive measures still in uh, coming from those countries that you mentioned, uh, Thailand or Vietnam or, or other countries in uh, Southeast, Southeast Asia. So that's the good news. And uh, uh, even though, uh, as you said, that uh, uh, the announcement is, is a kind of uh, vague, but uh, the, given the experience that we had in 2008 food price crisis, 
uh, so far we have not seen. And we still need to see whether in the coming months, especially in uh, uh, November, December, if the price goes up, uh, uh, we, we need to see that whether if there are any action, uh, even if not the ban, if uh, the taxes go up, then uh, there is a really, uh, we need to be uh, watchful and uh, that will be worrisome for, for the global rice market. Yeah, no, thanks. And and I, I think, um, you know, even you mentioned Myanmar with uh, uh, licensing requirements, you know, early on, or I believe in, in August and early September, there were uh, there were certain rumors that they would actually ban exports. Um, and that, in fact, did not happen. And I think, again, that's a that's welcome news. OK, we have a couple of questions for uh, Christina as well. Um, Christina, one is you can, if you can talk a little about what the impacts on East Africa, there was a little bit of confusion on what, um, you know, what to expect during an El Nino uh, event for East Africa. And I know that's an area that you track a lot with your early warning system. So that would be great if you could talk about that. And then there's another one that says, um, you know, to what extent are the, the weather anomalies for El Nino sufficiently refined? You know, what, you know, what, if, you know, in some areas of the world, there, you know, we can point to to say yes. Uh, typically, El Nino leads to a drought in these areas, or, or, uh, but, but in other areas, it, it's, it's, in, and in fact, the, the example here was Ecuador and, and Peru, um, sometimes seeing droughts and in, in floods in, in, in coastal areas and droughts in highlands, uh, highland areas. So if you can. Um, address both of those that would be great yeah yeah absolutely joe um east africa okay so we are coming off of multiple seasons of drought so we had up to five consecutive dry seasons and that's from the triple dip la nina that we had um el nino usually brings pretty wet conditions um, and that is expected to be enhanced because of the positive ID iod so um what that means is i think people are on high alert in terms of potential flooding that might happen this upcoming season. Um, OND is in the south of East Africa. That's going to be the short rains. That's Horn of Africa. So that's um, usually the rains are October, November, December. We're expecting those um, if it's following the trends of El Nino and what we're seeing in terms of the forecast, those are expected to be pretty um, abnormally high rains. Um, but what happens in the north of East Africa? So that would be parts of Ethiopia, also parts of Sudan, uh, South Sudan, is that we actually do see some drying uh, conditions there, so drier than average conditions. Um, so I think that certainly there's concern for East Africa because of um, coming off of such a dry season and having those heavy rains come when the soils are so dry could really impact or really have a you know potential flooding, result in flooding across those areas. But I think because of the combination of El Nino and the positive ID, it's of specific concern, especially for we're expecting heavy rains. And I think that's what already. Um, but it really, we, we don't know, right? So this El Nino, we know that it is a strong event. It's already a strong event. We know that when it's going to peak and we know that it, there's, there's a potential for it to go from March, April, May. There's stronger teleconnections in some areas and weaker teleconnections in others. So um, in terms of, um, I think Ecuador was one of the countries in Peru. I mean, what we do see from El Nino is that January to December, um, well, through December, rains can be below average in parts of northern South America. Um, but I think there is a, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in terms of what we can expect. Um, and that kind of goes back to Shirley's point, right? So each each event is different. Each individual country has different impacts. And I think it's important to kind of take everything with a grain of salt. But and now we're, we're at a point where we're already well into the El Nino. It's at its peak strength. We can look at the short term forecasts. Um, the longer range forecast for the next three months, and that'll really give us some insight into what we can expect um, and, and how that how this El Nino event with the positive ID will actually play out. I hope okay, I answered me, that, Joe. Yeah. No, thanks, Christina. And, and, and Seth, before I pass it back to you, I, I have one more. And Shirley, I'm going to address this to you. 
because I think you're you're better placed. Uh, there's a question in here about stock levels. And, and Abdullah showed some of the USDA numbers. I know the uh, FAO Amos numbers are slightly different, but still generally in the same ballpark in terms of the major holders of rice stocks. You know, you look to China, you look to India. Um, what sort of what sort of assumptions do you make as an analyst looking those stock levels in terms of trying to understand what countries will do, you know, or when you're making your you're putting together your forecasts, what what assumptions you make on terms of stock behavior um, generally? Is it just a residual or does it are you okay, please? No, thank you. Let me start with a bit of a premise here. And I think uh, there's been a webinar organized by Amis. I think it's also very much on point. Uh, the, the question that again, uncertainty perhaps may be a key word here. But uh, as we know, not a lot of countries measure effectively measure stocks. And so uh, and, and this is a constraint to analysis in that, of course, uh, the, the stock levels that we have in our balances uh, it may be realistic or unrealistic, depending on how much we're able to capture uh, certain market dynamics in some places. In some places, we have at least partial levels of observations, but in other ones, of course, we have zero information regarding the effective level of carryover stocks, right? And at the right period in the season, which, which is needed in terms of the, the timing of the assessment to be incorporated into a balance. So, so with that caveat that, of course, uh, the quality of stock information is, is, is very much dictated also by the lack of data availability or lack of effective measurement. In the case of rice, let me put it this way, this is perhaps a little bit more accentuated by, by the fact that, that the global market, even on the carryover side, is very much concentrated, right? So if you look at two major players, you look at China, you look at India, by our assessments, it, the two countries combined account for around 70% of, 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 of the carryover uh, figure that we have for the whole world, right? So uh, outside of these two countries, you actually in this to go to answer perhaps some comments that I said, well, those stock levels are really high, right? And if you look at, let's say, carryovers anywhere else, right? We're speaking about a figure that is around 55 million tons. So if you just to put it into context a little bit more, this is around 11%. Uh, of global production. So it's not something that is highly unreasonable. But again, with the caveat that a lot of uncertainty in terms of, of, of the effective stock levels and that there's a, a really dire need uh, to improve analysis by going in and really measuring stock levels, right? Then there's the second aspect of it in terms of, let's say, as, as I mentioned, for some countries, we know very little. For some other countries, we know a little bit more. Right. And, and and this is the case, for instance, in India. And this to go to you, the, the second aspect of your question is, is it just a residual? Well, in the case of India, not necessarily. We, we have very little knowledge regarding a, a, the size of private sector stocks because those are not measured. Right. But the Indian government does collect and measure a, and diffuse information and disseminate information regarding the size of its own carryovers. And of course, those follow the dynamics of, of the function of the public distribution system, the procurement system, right, and plans regarding, let's say, welfare schemes that the government of India might, might have planned for the year ahead or for the ongoing aspects. So it's a bit of an internal balance within a balance, but of course, also shaped uh, by expectations regarding where perhaps or, or indications by uh, government officials about where they see, let's say, uh, their public distribution and procurement needs headed in the new season, right? And this, I think, was particularly uh, relevant in the context of COVID when we had a lot of scaling up of welfare schemes in procurement to really address um, let's say it's some of the disruptions caused by the pandemic. So it's a bit of both. And with the caveat that we need to improve a great deal as well, in that a lot of it is, is, is reflective of a, lot, a great deal of concentration on, 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 on a few countries in terms of the stock sizes, right? Curly, thanks so much. That, that was excellent. Um, Seth, we're about out of time. What would you like to, how would you like to conclude? No, I was going to ask a question, but but given we've got two minutes, it was perhaps far too open ended. I mean, we did get a question about, hey, what are the the, the possibilities to to mitigate effects of El Nino? But I think that's a pretty broad, open ended question. And given some of the comments that everybody's made, that it it depends. There's a lot of geographic issues. There's good policies. There's bad policies. 
that's probably not one to ask in the last minute and a half. So Joe, uh, might we go around and say, hey, closing thoughts about what folks may be watching most closely as this in this rice market? Do we think we'll be better off in 12 months and we need to make it through? Or are there things that are of large concern? Does that make sense? Yeah, let's let's start with Christina, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, of course. I know from my side, I mean, we're really keeping an eye out for Southeast Asia. Um, and I know through the crop monitor for Amos, um, Australia wheat, that's different than than rice, but I did also want to make a note to that. Um, I think the, you know, what what might happen in the next three months will will give a lot of information in terms of what that might mean for for rice markets. Um, but yeah, in terms of El Nino, I think it, it, it's going to be we're going to see what really comes out. But I think we can we can pretty for sure know that um, we're expected to get some dry conditions across these like southern Southeast Asia's. And so that should be something that we could have heightened monitoring for. Thanks, Abdullah. Uh, no, I think we need to be watchful, as I said previously, that uh, what will happen in the next uh, couple of months. And what we need to also see whether the India extends uh, some of these bans or the taxes uh, beyond 2023, uh, because there is an election next year. So we, need, we really need to be watchful on that. And also we need to look at uh, whether the country's other exporters, uh, like the Myanmar did, if the other countries also make uh, or announce some some restrictions, new restrictions in the in the market, uh, so that we we know the what the market is uh, going on in in rice. Thank you. Who's how about you? Yes, thank you, Joe. I think one point to look at here in the eco waste region is if prices continue to go up, to what extent the new actually it is not that new. Eco waste regional reserve can actually be used to dampen the negative impact of the crisis. As I said, rice is part of the reserve, which is about 7%. So it is supposed to be there to avoid countries putting export restrictions or, or, and over trade restriction measures so that when we have a crisis, it can be managed at the regional level. So I'll be very curious to see. It has worked a little bit in the past, but uh, I will be curious to see how it can be used to. To, to dampen the negative impacts of the, of the crisis, should prices will continue to go up. Yeah, I, I think that it's a great question. And, and I also would apply that towards the ASEAN plus three uh, emergency rice reserve, uh, whether or not that will be utilized uh, uh, as well. Uh, Shirley, you get the last. Um, well, I mean, I think that these factors that they're the usual ones, simply because of the characteristics of the grace market, right? And again, this pervasiveness of government intervention. So, of course, going forward, given the current context, I think definitely a government policies will continue to be rather key, right? And of course, this is on the export side in terms of, let's say, what developments there may be regarding the implementation or the duration of, of, of current export restrictions of possible new ones, if, the, if any of them actually materialize, but also on the import side, uh, because again, the export restrictions are, are, are very much influential because of that, they're, they're functioning destabilizing by injecting uncertainty, right? But the conditions, uh, let's say, fostered by export restrictions can also be exacerbated by, on the import side, right? By by panic buying, by rushing into the market, right? By So we need to see, let's say, on both sides of the equation, whether, uh, whether we're going to see any further developments or even an easing, let's say, of, of current constraints. And one last aspect I would say would also be on, on, on the consumption side in particular, again, it, uh, particularly on the effects of these price hikes that we've already registered on the consumption side. And this is something that unfortunately I didn't get to, to delve so much during my intervention, is really that these price uh, these price hikes have come in a context of already very limited capacity by some buyers, right? And this is because, again, their capacity to pay for imports limited by uh, overall heightened food inflation, increased trade financing stocks, currency depreciations against the U.S. dollar, right? So this is the the, the and yet another layer of of limitations for them. And, and here's really where the food security concerns lie, right? And and what could happen if a, essentially these price hikes result in, in a rationing of demand, right? And, and I think that's that's very important to keep in mind as, as, as we move ahead. All right. 
Uh, great. No, thanks, everyone. We're going to have to close things down, um, but this has been wonderful. And uh, let's hope that in six months, we don't need to have another session on rice uh, because markets have calmed down. But if we if we do need to have one, we'll we'll be back with you guys. Um, any event, uh, thanks, uh, Seth, uh, to you. Thanks to all the panelists. This was really wonderful. And, and I think we got a um, in a very short time, got a feel for a lot of the, the major issues that are going on in the rice market. Uh, I, before I leave, I just want to thank the production staff uh, at IFRI, Mabel, Chris, uh, Michael, uh, and say he have, have done a great job pulling these things together and, and putting this out on so many platforms. Um, and so we're real happy. We, there will be a recorded a recording of this available. We uh, should be up uh, soon. Um, so you'll be able to look at it and and all of us certainly are available for uh, follow up emails and things like that. Uh, we'll have the presentations available up online as well. And with that, thanks so much, everyone. And uh, we'll be back. We hope to have another Amos webinar soon. Uh, uh, we we're, we're looking at the possibility of doing something in the oil seed complex to talk about vegetable oils and, and protein meals and some of the things that are going on. Um, I know some of your your eyes may glaze over. There's others whose eyes light up. So uh, we're looking forward to 